Good son for, for the patients of each one this evening. Glad for us having the visitors that we had this morning, but also glad for the patients of each and every one of you this evening. We trust that our study will be beneficial to us all, and certainly for those that have logged on to the website, the YouTube channel, or the Facebook page, as Rodney made mention this morning, on the, on the website there is a place where you can leave comments whether they're pro or not, or you can leave any Bible questions that you might have. So we urge you to take advantage of that opportunity that you have. The lesson this evening is a request, although a little different from the request that we had this morning, because the lesson this evening is going to be a repeat of a lesson that we did back in March of 2018. Back in those days, they only had audio recordings of the sermons, and somehow, some way, the audio on that particular sermon uh, did not work out to be able to hear the sermon. So there were some that were trying to listen to it, not able to do so, and so the request was to redo the lesson. And what that lesson pertains to is that of proper clothing. And we're thankful to have uh, the visual aspect of our sermon able to be viewed this evening. You know, this subject should be of interest to all of us. What we wear tells a lot about us. And what we wear affects us every day of our lives. What I mean by that is that every day, every day we make a decision on what it is that we're going to wear. And every day we also see the decision that other people have made in what they are going to wear. And whether we realize it or not, we must. And that is that God will hold us responsible for those decisions that we make. Clothing tells a lot about us. One of the things that it tells about us is it tells about our character, the kind of person that we are. We find in Genesis 38, we don't have time to read those verses 13 through 19, but this is the story of Judah early on in the history of the sons of Jacob. And Judah had sons, and he was able to secure Tamar. She was his daughter-in-law. And so we find that his first son was killed. Then she married the second son, as the law of Moses stated, and the second son was also killed. And in the result of all of this, Tamar, we read in those verses, had on what was called in the scriptures as a widow's garment. And we see in the process of this all, as the story goes on, she lays aside the widow's garment and she put on a veil to cover her face and appeared to be a prostitute. So we see then that in doing so, Judah thought that she was a prostitute, not knowing that it was Tamar. And of course, you can read the story there in Genesis chapter 38. So clothing, in this instance of which we see, depicted a woman at the beginning to be a widow, just her clothing, the appearance of that which she was wearing. But then we find the clothing depicted her to be a prostitute. All as a matter of the clothing that she wore. So that's what I mean when I say that clothing helps to describe a person's position in life. It's in Ezra chapter 3, we see the children of Israel, the children of Judah really, are coming back out of Babylonian captivity. And we find that everything is being rebuilt. The city of Jerusalem, the temple, 
and everything that's happened to be reinstated concerning the worship and all things pertaining unto uh, the rebuilding. And so here in Ezra 3 and verse 10, the attention turns to that of the priest. And the statement is made that they were put in the apparel. That simply means that it was not a widow's garment that the priest wore, but it was garments, apparel, that was peculiar, that was particular to the identifying of these individuals as being priests. In Esther, chapter 6, we know the story of Esther, at least I'm sure we're somewhat familiar with her. We find that she puts on royal apparel. In fact, the New King James Version says a royal robe was put, mentioned up there in those verses. So again, see, we're, we're not talking about the priest and their apparel, but instead we're talking about the royal apparel. We're not talking about the widow's garment. We're talking about the royal apparel. And in Proverbs 7, in issuing the warning concerning his son and what he needs to be aware of, the statement is made in Proverbs 7 and verse 10 concerning the attire of a harlot. So again, not royal apparel, not the apparel of a widow, or for that matter, even the priestly apparel, but it was the attire of a heart. So what I've used is to help us to understand is that clothing is a reflection of our character. And not only that, clothing is a reflection also of our attitude. In 2 Samuel 14 and in verse 2, we read concerning mourning apparel, that which a mourner at the death of a friend would adorn themselves with. So clothing always tells something about people. And the point that I'm trying to get us to see is this point. Clothing always tells something about us, about the people that we see. So we need to acknowledge that God has given guidelines. This is something that some people are hesitant to acknowledge. But we must acknowledge that God has given us guidelines concerning clothing and since God has given us these guidelines, whatever God's word teaches about it. That's what you and that's what I will face in the day of judgment. We must not ignore it, these guidelines. We must not just simply shrug it off, as I think that there are individuals that do so. And certainly, we don't need to laugh about the fact that God has given us guidelines. So it's not something that we need to take life. Again, as I said a moment ago, we dress every day. Every day. And therefore, every day, we are either pleasing or we are displeasing unto God. You know, many people think that since God has not named specific articles of clothing that are wrong and then specific articles of clothing that he would consider to be right, that really, because of that, it really doesn't matter what we wear. It really doesn't matter what we wear and that God is really not concerned with what we wear. But it's true. God has not named specific items or articles of clothing to be or not to be worn. But at the same time, he has given us principles. And it's the principles that we need 
to understand them. It's the principles that we need in understanding then to make application of. And it's these principles then that determines the right or the wrong of specific items of clothing that a Christian should or should not wear. So how do we determine if clothes like shorts or halters or short dresses or bathing suits or the tight fitting clothing, how do we determine whether that is proper to be worn by a Christian? Well, you know, is it as simple as some people make it? That they say, well, you know, I like it. That's the reason I wear it. I like it. That's the reason I think I ought to wear it, is I like it. Is it just as simple as a person making a statement? Well, this is stylish. It's what, it's what the style is. It's what the end thing is going on at the moment in the world around us. Or this one, by far, is probably the more popular one. Everybody's wearing them. So again, is that, is that just how simple it is? in determining the right or the wrong of the clothing that we make decisions on. Are these the things that we make something in our minds to be okay, it's all right, or whatever? Well, certainly not. This is not the basis on which that we as Christians need to decide. So to determine right or wrong, we're going to have to go to God's Word. And yes, God's Word hasn't given specifics, but God's Word has given principles. And that's what we need to focus our attention on. What are the principles that God has given? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we want to read, first of all, the King James Version, which I'm sure that most of us are familiar with the wording. And there it says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let's just, for the sake of it, read it as it is translated in the New King James. It says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. We see here in these verses the word modest. There is one of our principles. Again, not specifics of which it is, what it is, and what ain't to be worn, but the principle. And what we need to understand is what that word means. The word modest means decent. The word modest means restrained. That's the meaning of the word modest. It means simple in style. So that which is immodest would be that which is indecent. That which would be unrestrained. That which would be make immodesty wrong because it goes against this principle that we're seeing here. And then there's the word sobriety. The word sobriety means purity. But more importantly, it means sound thinking. We know what sober is as opposed to intoxicated. A person that's intoxicated doesn't have a clear mind. But if we're to be as Christians at all time, and we're not talking about it in the context of intoxication, we're talking still, though, in the context of sober, in the sense of sound thinking. And then we have the word shamefacedness. That word shamefacedness means having a bashful spirit. 
The word shamefacedness means and carries with it a sense of shame. According to W.E. Vine and his dictionary definition of New Testament words, he makes this statement. Modesty, which is fast or rooted in the character. So see, what these principles are telling us is that if we base our clothing and the decision on these principles, then that's going to portray our character. Because that's what the idea of modesty is. Fast or it is rooted in the character of a person. And what we see in these principles is the concept of shame. See, shame needs to be associated with nakedness. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye sight, that you may see. See, shame is associated with nakedness. It is to be associated. Obviously, we live in a time when everything is associated with nakedness but shame. But going back to the principles, when it comes to the decisions of the things that we wear, shame needs to be one of those principles that helps to determine. And concerning this nakedness that is mentioned here in the letter to the seven churches, you know, Nakedness may refer to nudity. I think that's sometimes the only way we think when we see or hear that word nakedness. We only think of it in terms of nudity, and that's sort of a definition of it. But also, nakedness, as we find it in the scriptures, is referring to and can refer to inadequate clothing. I want to show you what I mean. Adam and Eve, the Bible tells us that they were first nude. Notice Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I understand the word there, naked, to be nude. Not having a single stitch of clothing, of any sort. Ah. But then, we find in chapter 3 and verse 7 that when the eyes of both of them were open, they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. This, of course, is after they have sinned. Sin is now being introduced into the world. Before, nakedness had no shame. But with sin introduced into the world, there is now shame associated, to be associated with nakedness. Then we read that they were partially clothed with what the King James Version says that were aprons. And they knew, I think the New American Standard Version says coverings. But let's look at it. We read there in Genesis 2. Let's go to, which read chapter 3 and verse 7. Let's look at verse 10. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. But remember, we read at this point where they sewed together fig leaves and made aprons. So no, they're not nude as they were previously. Now they have something on, but the statement is still made in regards to that that they were naked. So that shows us that nakedness can refer to nudity, but it can also refer to being inadequately 
clothes with having wearing of something. So God replaced the aprons with what the King James Version calls coach. The New American Standard calls it tunic. That's in chapter 3 and verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made coats of skin and clothed them. So God replaced those aprons. And we see that obviously the reason that God replaced them was that they were inadequate. They were still naked in that sense of the word. He replaced what would be probably the shorts with garments. And it's my understanding that the coats or the tunics, whichever translation you use, means that it was a garment that hung from the shoulders all the way down past the knees. That's the tuna that God clothed them with. So another thing about this word nakedness, it's also used as a euphemism, a euphemism representing sexual intercourse. Look with me in Leviticus chapter 18. Well, let's see, I don't have it on the screen, but in Leviticus 18 and verse 6, none of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. And then in Leviticus 20 and verse 7, if a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He is uncovered. His sister's nakedness, he shall bear his guilt. So we have a euphemism in the use of the word or that phrase. And we know what we, a euphemism is. We talked about it this morning. It's a word that is a little less expressive, a little less offensive, a little less distasteful than just simply coming out and saying sexual intercourse. They saw the nakedness is what we find here. So nakedness, with its obvious sexual appeal, is a blessing in marriage. That's only where it is a blessing. And nakedness, with that same sexual appeal and implications, is a curse. It is a shame when it is displayed outside of marriage. This is a concept that the world doesn't understand. They do not phantom those two statements. Because we have nakedness all around us each and every day of our lives. And I fear that if we are not careful as Christians, that we will begin to accept some of the concepts, some of the attitudes of the world. And I'm afraid we've already accepted it way too much when it comes to this word, nakedness. I was thinking in our attitude, I fear, is not anywhere near what the scriptures would have us to sin. So the priest wore pants in order to prevent the exposing of the necklace. They wore those under their robes. In Exodus 28, verse 42, thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from, and I think one translation says, from the loins down unto their thighs, or another translation said, from the waist to the thighs. So what does that tell you? If the priest, if they showed anything from their waist, from their loins, down to their thighs, and that was nakedness, is that our attitude? Is that our definition of nakedness? <laughs> Not hardly. Because we see a lot of thighs, and we see a lot of 
of worship in our society today. Do we not? It's everywhere. Everywhere you want to look. So, in fact, even the women of idolatry in the days of Isaiah, they knew the embarrassment of lifting up those skirts to cross the river. In Isaiah chapter 47, verse 2, take the millstone and grind meal, remove your veil, take off the skirt. Take off the skirt, uncover the thigh, pass through the river. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance. I will not arbitrate. And I think the translation I have on the screen is, I will not meet thee as a man. But what that means is, I'm not going to arbitrate this time. God is saying, I'm not going to debate this time. It is what it is. And that's that. Nakedness is what it is. It's the revealing, the exposing of the thighs. Even the heathen women, the women that worship the idols, understood that. So again, exposing the thighs reveals, the Bible says, the shame, or should carry with it, the shame of nakedness. So any exposing, as I said just a moment ago, of the area from the loins, from the waist to the thighs, is nakedness. God calls it nakedness. Now the question is, do we? And you know, this shame is exposed before men. When women wear skirts and dresses above the knee, whether they're standing or whether they're sitting. This shame is certainly exposed when a woman wears a miniskirt, because it doesn't matter whether they're sitting or standing and wearing a miniskirt. This shame is exposed when they wear low-cut dresses and blouses, whether the low-cut is in the front or whether it's in the back. This shame is exposed with the strapless or the backless dresses. See, God, God didn't specifically name all of this, but he gave us these principles that we ought to be able to make application of. The same thing is true with the shoulderless tops, which has been a recent style of late. Well, then there is the tight or the form-fitting articles of clothing. The leotards, the bicycle shorts, the leggings with nothing else worn, below the waist, or even for that matter, with nothing else worn that only does not reach even the knee. Still, the leggings are exposing of the thighs. And then there's the swimsuits. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the one piece or the two piece. Swimsuits would truly not fit into these principles. Then there's the tube or the tank top that was popular and still is. Or the high split dresses that exposes the thigh. There's nothing wrong with the dress having a split when it shows the calf of a leg. But when a split shows the thigh, what is the thigh? It's nakedness, according to the scriptures. And those generally abbreviated uniforms that are worn by the majorettes and the cheerleaders and the flag teams, the drill teams. But you know, all that's innocent because it's school. There's nothing innocent about your modesty. There's nothing innocent about the wearing of that which is not modest, that which is not manifest in sobriety, and that which does not manifest Shamefacedness. And you know, the same is exposed when women, with women, when men wear such things as shorts that reveal the thighs, whether it's standing or sitting. Sometimes clothing can be modest when a person's standing. 
This goes for both men and women. But then when they sit, then there is what? There is the exposing of the thighs. And there should be shame of nakedness associated with that. And of course, when men wear no shirts, as they have a tendency to do in the hot weather, or whenever they're engaged in some kind of physical activity. You know, somebody asked, what about the person who can dress in an immodest manner and not feel ashamed? The question is, you know, is it still wrong? Because they don't feel the shame. All I can say in answer to that is that if they don't feel the shame, it's because they have lost the shame. They have lost that sense of shame that would otherwise have prevented them from wearing whatever that immodest piece of clothing might have been. And you know, when parents, when parents have lost their sense of shame, this is something we need to think about seriously as well. When parents have lost their sense of shame to whatever the degree, the child is likely to have an even lesser sense of shame. So we do ourselves and we do our children a great harm when we allow ourselves to lose our sense of shame. We lose our sense of shame when we condition ourselves to wear or to see things repeatedly. That's how sense of shame is lost. It's just like, you know, we become conditioned to seeing or wearing something. We become conditioned and thus we, the Bible calls it the word seer. And all, all that a steward is, is a, is a callus. And we know what a callus is. Either from hard work, we build up calluses on our hand, or maybe we've had a bone, and the result of that bone has left a callus. But it's just like what Timothy was told in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2, they have seared their consciences with a hot iron. That's how we lose our sense of shame by repeatedly, by familiarity with something. Another principle we find in Galatians chapter 5, we're not going to read verses 19 through 21 because we're familiar with the works of the flesh, but in amongst those things that are listed is the word lasciviousness. That word lasciviousness is a work of the flesh, and those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It is defined in when it's translated in Romans 13 and verse 13 as the word wantonness. And it means that which would produce lewd or lustful thoughts or emotions. That's lasciviousness. We normally associate it with dancing, the modern dance, but we're just as well too need to apply it in the manner of what and how we clothe ourselves. Because it is one of those principles. And then another dis principle is the distinction between male and female. You remember we talked about in Genesis 38 a widow's garment. It was a widow's garment, not a widower's garment. There's a difference in a woman and a man's garment. And that attire of a harlot that we made reference to in Proverbs 7 and verse 10, that would imply a woman, would it not? In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's the King James rendering on that verse. That word effeminate 
It's a word that means soft, soft to the touch. It's used oftentimes of a boy kept for homosexual relations with a man, of a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness. That's there in his def definition of the word. Wikipedia says that it is a term frequently applied to womanly behavior, demeanor, style, clothing, and appearance displayed by a boy or a man. So, is it right for men to wear dresses or effeminate style, effeminate type of clothing? You know, consider this question, seriously. Suppose I, as a man, decided to wear a dress to services tonight. Would there be anything wrong with my doing that? You know, after all, I don't find anything in the Bible that says a man shall not wear a skirt. Don't find anything in the Bible that says that. Somebody says, well, you know, I don't believe you ought to. Okay? Why don't you believe that I ought to? Somebody says, well, do you think God will be pleased with it? Well, the answer, on what basis do we determine whether God will be pleased or not? You know, if God has authorized me to wear a dress, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter what you think. I could put on a dress or I could put on a skirt if God authorized it. If God has not authorized it, then I don't need to clothe myself in that way. If one divine principle is violated, I have no right. So what is to determine the answer? Well, you know, this and other questions can't be settled by using our own preferences. It can't be settled by using our own opinions. It can't be settled by what is being presently practiced, what's being popularly worn. It can't be settled by fashion or style because all of that's determined by the world. So we have to ask, has God set forth principles that allows or forbids? And we've seen that he has. We've looked at 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10. Modesty, sobriety, shamefacedness. We saw Galatians chapter 5, lasciviousness or wantonness. So we've seen these principles. And we, or do we, agree on the principles that we have examined? Namely, modest, sobriety, Shamefacedness, lasciviousness, and distinction between the male and the female. So see, something is not wrong just simply because I don't like it. And something is not right simply because I do like it. <laughs> that settles nothing. Nothing whatsoever. <clears throat> In the Huntsville Times in 1985, Madame Moselle, which is the magazine, in 1985, pondered men's skirt revival. Quote, they may not be wearing them yet in your neighborhood, but it never hurts to be prepared. Writer Julia Thurman in the April Madame Moselle ponders the meaning behind the recent revived phenomena of men wearing skirts. Men and women can still wear the same clothes and still remain men and women, says one designer of skirts made for men. Many of you, I'm sure, remember the Phil Donahue show. 
Well, on a particular program in December the 16th, 1981, he had two men on that show that were designers of men's skirts. And one was dressed in what he called a skirt suit. And the other one was wearing a dress. Women in the audience got upset at him wearing the dress. Some said they couldn't understand it at all. The man on stage wearing the skirt suit said, I find wearing a dress very comfortable. It's not tight like pants. The looseness feels better. The air circulates better. And it's just more comfortable. The only difference is that I have a suit without pant legs. A woman in the audience who disapproved said, it threatens my femininity. I would not go out with a man wearing a skirt. I'd divorce my husband if he wore one. And to that, the men replied, are you for discrimination? That's always the answer, isn't it, in our day and time? Are you for discrimination, or do you want to be fair? He went on to explain that he and the other gentlemen designed skirts depending on what they wanted to do, whether to play or hunt or to go out to eat. One woman in the audience said, well, I can't see you wearing your skirt to the office. The other man replied, why not? When women first started wearing pants to the office, they weren't accepted, but over a period of time, look what's happened. A woman in the audience who approved said, I hope it catches on. So one day my son can wear a skirt because now my daughter wears his jeans. The rest of the program, had the men using the same arguments for wearing dresses as women were arguing for wearing pants. And to give you some idea, here's what they look like. Men wearing skirts. And this came from the New York Times in June of 2017 which was lessons entitled Lessons from the Great Male Skirt Rebellion of 2017. Quote, as Mr. Gautier told the New York Times after his show in 1984, wearing a skirt doesn't mean you're not masculine. Masculinity doesn't come with clothes. It comes from something inside you. Men and women can wear the same clothes and still be men and women. It's fun. It may have taken more than 30 years, the article goes on to say, but his words are beginning to seem almost pathetic. I, I said the wrong word. <laughs> I said pathetic. It's not pathetic. It's prophetic. Excuse me. Odds are we're going to see more of it. Employers had better get ready. And one other was an article again in the New York Post, not the New York Times, but the New York Post, in January of 2018, entitled, Are Skirts the Next Men's Fashion Trend? It says that in an era which rules seem meant to be broken, and more and more people are calling for gender equality, it should surprise no one that the fashion world is the head cheerleader for change. Case in point, the fall 2018 menswear designers presenting a variety of skirts on the runway. You know, I believe that there would be men willing to wear dresses. And Though there might be for just a few that would do so at the very beginning. And when it all began, think about this, when it all began with women wearing pants, there was only a few that were brave enough to start wearing them. But then it became to be more and more. And now you can hardly find a woman that doesn't wear pants. And so I, too, would dare say 
the point has been reached where some girls and women do not even have a dress or a skirt in their entire wardrobe. So see, it's the logical progression. Well, another, another wrong word. No way to call it progress. It's another digression, I guess we might could say, for those who are unaware of the teaching of God's word on the subject that we're looking at tonight of proper dress. So is it right for a woman to wear pants or masculine tight clothing? Well, the same principles that forbids a man wearing a dress or other feminine tight clothing, that would also forbid a woman to wear masculine tight clothing. And if not, why not? You know, in the beginning, it was slacks, and they, they were pretty slack. And now, nine out of ten will, at some time or another, wear pants and jeans that get tighter, that get more form-fitting, and reveal every curve. I remember very well, a few years ago, that undergarments went a, under a tremendous change because the seams of the undergarments had to be done away with because the clothing, the pants were so tight fitted that you could see a woman's undergarments. So underwear had to go under, undergo a complete overhaul in order to prevent that from being the case. So this is modest. And this is whether it's pants or dresses, it doesn't matter. You know, when the move is made toward looser fitting pants, they be begin to appear more manly, more masculine. But still, my point is this. We're still violating another principle, and that's the principle of distinction. Let's notice some principles. In the beginning, God made them male and female. God made them different. Different from all animals. God made man and woman different from each other. Why did he make them different? Did he make them different so they could try to look alike? So they could try to act alike? Well, that's a contradiction, isn't it? He made them different because they had different roles. And we're going contrary to God to blur or to destroy that distinction. Even in the physical appearance or in the roles that God has assigned. Notice the distinction. Genesis 2 verse 18, God created woman to be a help suitable for man. Genesis 3, verse 16, woman's desire was to be to the husband, and he would rule over her. In Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19, man was to work to provide for the woman. Chapter 3, verse 23, he assigned man the work of killing the ground. And in verse 16, he assigned woman the work of bearing children. You see, even under the law of Moses, God demanded distinction. He maintained that there's to be a distinction between man and woman, and thus this principle of distinction continues. It continues from the patriarchs now into the law of Moses. We see it in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. So what we must understand is that those coats that God made back there in Genesis 3 and verse 21 must have been different. How do I know they were different? Because of necessary inference. Because of this principle that is all throughout the scriptures of distinction. I know that those coats that God made 
Adam and Eve were different. I know that. Then two, distinction, let us understand, is a divine principle. Certainly, we're not under the law of Moses. I know that. I've heard people make the argument, oh, you can't use Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. I know we're not under the law of Moses, but can we violate God's principle of distinction? That's the question. You know, what would you think about a man today putting on lipstick, putting the nail polish? What would be wrong with that? Well, he's acting like something he's not. He's a man acting like a woman. And, you know, that would be a man acting and dressing feminine when God made man masculine. And on the same basis, God has made woman feminine and women ought not to act and to dress like men. You know, in the New Testament, there's the distinction between male and female. As we said, we looked at it under the patriarchs. We saw it under the law of Moses. Now, let's look what we see under the New Testament. In the New Testament, God says there's to be a distinction and chose there's to be a distinction. And God wants it maintained. We're different physically. We've been kept that way from the beginning. There are different roles. There's the role of headship, just talked about in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. There's the role of subjection in Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23. There's the matter of who is to wear the head covering and who is not in 1 Corinthians 11. Also in 1 Corinthians 11, there's the matter of who is to wear the long hair and who is to wear the short hair. Again, what are we looking at here? We're looking at distinction. We're looking at difference in the roles when it comes to the home. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, the woman is to guide the house. In 1 Timothy 5, or Titus 2, and verse 3 and 5, there to be keepers at home. So there's differences in role in the home. There's differences when it comes to the roles in marriages. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, men are to treat their wives, they're to give honor unto them. In Ephesians 5, verse 23, wives are to submit to their husbands. And there's differences in the roles when it comes to the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, a woman is to keep silent in the church. 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12, she is not to usurp authority over the man. All of this shows distinction. And these distinctions must not be removed. They must not be blurred because God has set them in order. It's not a matter of choice. It's not a matter of I like it or it's a matter of I don't like it. Clothes, actions, attitudes, any of those things that blur or destroy the distinction between man and woman ought not to be. I'm not, if I'm not a homosexual, I don't need to act like one. And if I'm not a woman, I don't need to act like a man. Let's see, let me say that well. If I'm not a woman, I need to act like a man. If I'm not a man, I need to act like a woman. Men are masculine by nature. Let men act and look like men. Women are feminine by nature. Let women act. And look like women. Whether it's clothes, whether it's hair, whether it's the actions, all of those things indicate what we are. We must dress outwardly to match what we are inwardly and what we are physically. And you know, too, another thing, this women wearing masculine-type clothing, they're giving endorsement to the women's liberation movement. 
and other similar movements. You know, it was in the late 60s, early 70s, that the women's liberation, women's, uh, I'll get it right in a minute. Well, let's just say the women's liberation movement began. And it was quickly, within less than a decade, followed by the unisex movement. And if you live back then, you, you know what I'm talking about. Those are the years when it really impacted this United States. It was a movement to equalize. And I really prefer the word nullify, because that's really more true of what it was all about. It was a movement to nullify the distinction between the sexes. And I realize that the majority of this endorsement on the part of women today who are Christians, and I realize it's done unintentionally. There's a generation now that is removed from the 60s and the 70s. They don't have any idea of what happened, what took place back then, how things were before the 60s and the 70s. But this is when it happened. And yes, it's a movement that has worked, and it continues to work, to destroy every principle that's involved in distinction between the sexes. These movements have led to where we are today. And you know where we are today. We know where we are today in the matter of the women's liberation movement, the unisex movement, and how that has opened up the door to homosexuality. Because again, anything that has to do with the blurring of the sexes, homosexuality is going to be right there knocking on the door. And not only that, but we're seeing here in the last few months this idea of gender neutrality. Gender neutral. See, this all had its birth back in the 60s and the 70s. So it leads to where we are today. We're becoming gender neutral. And we must not, as Christians, endorse whether we do it intentionally or whether we do it unintentionally to such ungodly movements such as this. A Christian needs to seek to avoid any encouragement to such a movement. In the conclusion of our study, the eternal principles of God's word must be respected, if not by the world, then at least by Christians. You know, too often we're persuaded by the world to conform rather than to be different. Christians, as we talked about this morning, they're to be the salt and they're to be the light of this world. But has our salt lost its potency? And has our light become so dim that it's hardly recognizable? So how can we influence? How can our influence be any good to others if we're being influenced by them. We're being influenced by the principles of the world rather than the principles of God. We're letting the principles of this world take precedence over the things that we've studied tonight. Modesty, sobriety, shamefacedness, lasciviousness, and distinction. So what I hope we'll do is show the world and not be ashamed, but show the world that we're Christians by our clothes, by our actions, by our speech, and by our attitudes.
I thank you so much for your time. We went over. But I appreciate, hopefully, that we can get this lesson on the website in its entirety and not a jumbled whatever. I haven't listened to it, what happened to the other one, but hopefully this one will give both the video as well as the audio. I know this lesson is not conducive to help someone that's not a Christian to think about becoming one. But in just the few moments that we have, think about it. Are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? Are you able to pray to the God of heaven and call upon him as your heavenly father? Have your sins been forgiven? Don't be in denial of sin. Because if you know the difference in right and wrong and you're accountable, you have sinned. And sin is what the gift of God through his son is all about. The Christ came into this world, lived the perfect life. He became that lamb without spot and without blemish so that when he was sacrificed, his blood could and does atone for our sins. We have much to be thankful for to our Father. We have much to be thankful for to our Lord and Savior that they were both willing to do such to enable you and me to have our sins forgiven, to have the hope of heaven, and the hope of eternity of being with them throughout the ceaseless ages. Think about your spiritual condition. If we can assist you in the end of your obedience to the gospel, let tonight be the night. Maybe you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, but yet you know there's sin in your life. Maybe in some of these areas, you see the influence that the world has had over you. You may be living in your life by some of the principles that the world and have forgotten some of the things that God would have us to live by. Then let us confess those things. Let's admit them to ourselves. And if we need to acknowledge, confess our faults one to another, that we can pray one for the other. If we can assist you, please let it be known while we stand together to stand. Thank you.